And I said earlier that uh, Pastor was sick. He started on Tuesday and hasn't gotten too much better and definitely wasn't ready for today. And I had a text yesterday that said, well, maybe Michael Gent or Daniel Gent would be speaking this morning. And then I'm not sure if the two of you arm wrestled and the winner is coming up to speak or how that was decided. But later last night, it was decided that Daniel would come and, and speak. So the, the new uncle for the fifth time or so will be speaking to us. So Daniel, welcome. Change that to 14 nieces and nephews. I'm not sure what the correct number is, actually. Oof. Well, I'm going to start with praying. And I'm probably going to do that again before we actually get into the message. But dear God, we ask that you would be with us. Lord, we ask that you would show us who you are. Amen. So um, I figure I've been away long enough. Maybe I should introduce myself. Um, let's see, three and a half years ago, my wife and I moved to Iraq to teach in a Christian school. And we were there for two years, and that seemed like the time God had a, for us to be there. And in that period, I went, I really like teaching. I think I'd like to do more of this. And I ended up in grad school in Montana, which I'm finishing up in spring. Um, and I don't know what comes after that. We could be back here. We, we'd take your prayer for that, just that God would guide us wherever we go. Um, and that has a little bit of bearing um, on just a few things I'll be talking about later. Um, one other thing. So I was here in service about eight months ago. We were going back to visit Iraq. And the way the schedule worked out, we managed to swing by Humboldt on the way to San Francisco where we were flying out. And we visited the church, and afterwards, Claire and I were talking about the trip, and we talked about being here for that Sunday. And being here, we, we were so loved by the congregation. And every time we've swung, swung back in the three and a half years we've been gone, every time we come back for a Sunday, there's just a stream of people who is, oh, I need to go say hi. And there's a stream of people coming to me. And every time I'm here, I'm so loved by you. And I wanted to say thank you. Um, so, getting into what I want to be talking about, I'm going to put a little bit of background. Uh, right at the beginning of this semester, um, one of the grad students who lives in the same apartment complex I do, we walk home all the time, and I forget how the conversation started, but in the middle of it, he was like, well, you know, I've never read the Bible. That seems like it would be a good thing to do. I don't, I'd like to, maybe it seems like it'd be easier to read it with someone. <laughs> I'm like, you, uh, you want to, like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I mean, it could be a group or just you and I, whatever, whatever you, you think would be good. <laughs> okay, this will be fun. I mentioned it offhandedly the next day at school, and another grad student goes, oh, I want in on that. <laughs> so um, there's four of us. Um, two of us are believers and two of us are not, and we've been reading through the Bible together. And we've been reading through the Old Testament and reading through the book of John and trying to tie them together. And uh, what I wanted to end that whole session with was I, wa I wanted to go through enough of the Old Testament that we could read the Matthew genealogy and it would have meaning. Um, and what I want to try and do this morning, and I know this is probably not a good idea, I want to read the Matthew genealogy <laughs> and see if we can read that and see that it has meaning. Um, one thing that when we read through the Bible, it shouldn't be hidden knowledge. It shouldn't be secret things that are for people who study. That what it has to say is actually really plain. And to summarize, what, what is the genealogy? What's it there for? It's, this is Jesus. It's, it's there to tell us who he is, that we would know him in the power of his resurrection. And so I want to pray for that, and then we'll jump into this. God, I ask that you would open your word to us, that we would know you in the power of your resurrection, that we would have fellowship with you in your suffering. Lord, we ask that you would show us yourself, that we would be like you. Amen. So, if you want to flip with me to Matthew chapter 1. <laughs> 
So the way I went about this is I grabbed a Bible dictionary and went about looking up the meaning of the names um, and then went about looking up other scripture that attached to those names. And I don't know that this is what the, the way the genealogy should be read, but I know that it's true because it's all scripture. So we have um, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And right there, and I think it's really funny, it's this is Jesus, the beloved, the son of the father. And we get into um, Abraham. And I don't think I'm going to read through the begats. I'm just going to follow the names through. Um, and you can follow along and read the begats if you want to. Abraham is father of many. Isaac is to laugh. And Jacob is supplanter or heel catcher. And evidently, it's literally heel catcher. We take the word supplanter because, well, he's grabbing onto someone else's heel. And it takes me to two other verses. Um, Satan, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. It's, I will supplant God himself. And in Genesis, God speaking to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and you will strike at his heel. And then in the Psalms, he who sits in the heavens laughs at them. The Lord holds them in derision. And I think right at the beginning we have Satan tries to set himself up that there's some kind of struggle between him and God, but there is no struggle between Satan and God. God laughs at him. He holds him in derision. God has a plan. And as we see through this genealogy, it wraps back to that. We start with Satan sets himself up against God and God laughs at him. But we're going to come back to that because he does more than laugh. Judah he shall be praised, or just praised. And sometimes in the names, we see who Jesus is, but sometimes in the stories, who these people are, we see who he is. Leah names her son Judah in a series of sons named Struggle. God will judge between us. A true, every one of her, not every, but most of her sons, she names after the fight with her sister for her husband's affection. And finally, there in the middle, she goes, no, I'm going to praise the Lord. And God takes that son and goes, no, th this, this, is, this is true. This is what we need to grab. This is where Jesus is. That in this struggle here on earth, no, we're putting all of that aside. I will praise the Lord. Judah's sons, Perez and Zerah, which mean a breach and a rising, um, the idea of the rising is specifically the sun rises, a light rises. It reminds me of Malachi, a son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And I think a breach arising and Hezron is enclosed and Ram is high, that God surrounds us, he rises around us, he holds us together and he sets us on high in uh, the Psalms. He shall shelter me in the day of trouble. He shall hide me in his tent. He will set me high upon a rock. Moving through. Aminadab, its servant or relative of the prince. Nashon, diviner or enchanter. And the idea that um, he knows the future. Nothing is hidden from him. Um, in just put a historical note, Nashon was alive in Moses' time. He came out of Egypt. His sister was Aaron's wife, side note. Um, but we have Nashon and his son Salmon and his son Boaz. Salmon is garment, Boaz is strength. Salmon married Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho. Boaz married Ruth, the Moabitess. And we have a one-two punch. Both of those, if we go back to the law, are forbidden marriages. Um, in Deuteronomy, no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even after ten generations. There's nothing in the law about when you get into the land, oh, keep some. It said, wipe it clean. And yet we have Rahab and Ruth pulled out. And I think right there in the middle of it, we see that God's heart wasn't in a written law, 
God's heart was to redeem. And that these two men somehow looked through and saw in the law that, no, the heart of God is to save. Salma on his garment, um, Ruth, speaking to Boaz, I call it Ruth's proposal, spread the cor corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. That in there, Bo Boaz shows this picture. He's not afraid to risk his inheritance to redeem the woman he loves. This is a picture of Jesus. And I think as, as we read through the genealogy, if we keep these characters in mind, this is Jesus. This is what, we're, this is what Christmas is about. This is what we're celebrating. We're celebrating a covering. We're celebrating being enclosed. We're celebrating being redeemed. Obed, serving. Jesse, Yahweh, or Yahweh is, or Yahweh's gift, or wealthy. It's hard to translate. <laughs> I want to flip to Isaiah. Um, let's see, in Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. The branch shall grow out of the roots. The branch, the nazir. That's actually the verse where in Matthew, a little bit later, it says, this is where it says, he shall be called a Nazarene, a Nazir from Jesse. Going on a little bit from there, and it's the same idea. And in that day, there shall be a root in Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the, Gentile, the, the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious." If we look at not just the name, but what is attached to the name, when they go back through the Old Testament, they take these ideas and hang them on these character hooks. I think what we see in Jesse is that Jesus is for all of us. He, was, he came for the Gentiles. I don't actually have the references, but all through the Minor Prophets, we see saviors will come out of Zion and redeem the mountains of Esau. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. It, the promise is to us and our children, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And now we're at David, which means beloved. Um, David is probably the most difficult character in the Bible for me. And God calls him beloved. God redeems him, says, this is a man after my own heart. A few sections that I want to read... Um, David sins with Bathsheba, and we know that story. A son's born. Nathan confronts David. David repents, and the response is, The Lord has taken away your sin, but the son born to you will die. Right at the beginning of this, it highlights that Jesus is the son of David. And I think right there, we have this picture of the Lord forgives your sin, but the son has to die. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the son that died that we could be redeemed. A little bit later in his story, God speaking to David, would you build me a house fit for me to dwell in? I will raise up from your offspring one of your own sons. I will establish his kingdom and he will build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. Again, both of those were fulfilled in the next generation. David's son did die. Solomon did build a temple. But Jesus has built, has built a house fit for God to dwell in. Who is Jesus? The builder of the house fit for God to dwell in. The sacrifice for sins. Now, I want to flip and read in Psalm chapter 9. Um, Uh-oh. Don't have a... I don't have a reference there. I'll have to find it the old way. Psalm 9, in the little preliminary that a lot of the psalms have, it says it's the psalm of David, and then it says, set it to the tune, the death of the son. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and I'm, I won't read, I'm not necessarily going to read all of it. I'll jump around a little bit, but I'm just starting at the beginning and we'll read some. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to, praise to your name, O Most High. 
When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish in your presence. For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne, judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever. O enemy, destructions are finished forever. You have destroyed their cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And, for th and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And for some reason, David takes all of this and goes... This needs to be tied to the death of the son. And it's funny to me that he would at the beginning say, this song is somehow the same as the death of the son. O oh, enemy, destructions are finished forever. Jesus made an end of it. Christ the child, and we'll, we'll see in a moment, and a child shall lead them. But Christ the judge, Christ the righteous one, this is Jesus, righteous, fulfilling, fulfilling the law, fulfilling the wrath of God in his own death. Righteous and mercy meet. Justice, well, justice and mercy have kissed. <laughs> and now we get to Solomon, whose name is Peaceful. The Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the government will be upon his shoulders. And I guess maybe I'll flip there and actually read the whole thing. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, in or to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Christ our peace. Rehoboam, enlarger of the people. Also in Isaiah, enlarge the place of your tent and stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. And I think this goes back to the idea that Jesus came not for the Jews only, but for all of us. That there is this idea of these people are who, th these are God's chosen people. But now we, the church, are chosen of God. It's what it means. And Jesus came to accomplish that. And now we have a list of names. Abijah, my father is Yahweh. Asa, physician and the cure. Jehoshaphat, Yahweh judges. Joram, Yahweh exalts. Uzziah, Yahweh strengthens. Jotham, Yahweh is upright or perfect or righteous. Jesus in John again and again talked about, I came to glorify my father. This is who he is. Father, glorify your name. And God responds, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The, we have the genealogy to tell us who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? He is the glory of God. He brings glory to God. He points us to the Father and says, come to me. I and the Father are one. Some other just notes in there. Um, Uzziah, at his time, is, that is the time of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Asa, Jesus is our physician. Jesus is our cure. Ahaz is possessor. And we see it a bunch of places in the New Testament, but I'm grabbed Romans. For, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Who is Jesus? In him all things hold together. He possesses all things. Hezekiah is the might of Yahweh. And this is Jesus. Manasseh is forgetting. He forgets our sins. He separates us from our transgressions. It's from the east, from the west. He forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. 
Ammon is builder. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Josiah is Yahweh heals. Jeconiah is Yahweh establishes. That Christ builds us up as living stones. He heals us. He establishes us. And if you go through the genealogy, one side note, it has this comment at the bottom. There's 14 generations from this person to this person, and there's 14 generations from this person to this person. But if you count it, there aren't. <laughs> Unless you double count some of the names. You have to double count Jeconiah. And in the genealogy, it sets it up. There's Jeconiah. You're carried away to Babylon. And there's Jeconiah. And it's almost, it's very intentionally establishing Babylon, Jeconiah, Babylon, Jeconiah. Yahweh establishes, even in confusion, which is what Babylon means, Yahweh establishes. That Satan can bring nothing that God cannot just tamp down and do what he does. Shealtiel, I asked of God. Zerubbabel, born in Babylon. Abiud, my father is majesty. Eliakim, raising up by God. I asked of God. I was born in confusion. I was born in sin. But my father is majesty. And he has raised me up. God is so good to us. This is Jesus. That while we were yet sinners, he came. He loved us. He died for us. This is love. Not that we loved him, but he loved us and sent his son. Azor is the helper. This is Jesus, our helper. Zadok is just. This is Jesus. He is our justice. And now I need to read my writing. Achian, the Lord establishes. Eliud, God his praise or God's majesty. This is Jesus. Eliezer, the help of God. Mathan, the gift or gift of God. And then we close with, again with Jacob, which is the supplanter or heel catcher. But now it's followed by Joseph, which is let him add. Not only does God hold Satan in derision, but everything that Satan would try to do, God says, no, I'm going to take that and turn it to good. You can do nothing but add to my goodness. That there is no struggle between light and darkness. When, when there is light, darkness flees. And anything that Satan tries to do, God just takes and uses it as establishing himself, bringing more glory, bringing more salvation. And we close with Jesus, the Christ. Yahweh saves the anointed. This is Jesus, the Savior. There's a lot of other things we could hit in there. Um, something that I think is interesting, it divides it into three sections. And if we went back and looked from Abraham to David, from David to Jeconiah, and from Jeconiah to the end, the names are a little bit themed. Abraham begins with the father, David begins with the beloved, and it's the idea of our healer, our savior, the praise of God. And the last begins with the help, or I would say is themed around the gift of God, the help of God. Each is 14, which is a double seven, is a double perfection that you have, I think, a picture of the Trinity right there. And so this is Jesus, in him the fullness of God dwells. He is our all in all. Linda told me not to run short, but it looks like I'm going to run short. <laughs> <laughs> there is one block of, other block of scripture that I wanted to read. It's Philippians 2. Um, if the purpose of the genealogy is to say that this is Jesus, this passage of scripture just stands out to me. Jesus Christ, 
who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's an interesting passage to me because it's, God has a lot of names. We just read Psalm 42. <laughs> um, but here it says, therefore he has given him the name above every other name that one is singled out at the name Jesus, at the name of Savior. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess, this is Jesus. He's our Savior. He is all of these things. He is the glory of the Father. He is our helper. He is our physician and our cure. But the name Savior, for whatever reason, God took and said, this is the important one. And I think that makes a lot of sense. It shall come to pass in the last days that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, whoever calls him Savior, will be saved. Amen. Well, we've got a little bit of time. Let's read the rest. Let's read a little bit more of the Matthew story. I don't think I'm going to comment on it, but it's there. Now, so I'm in Matthew 1. The birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you marry your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Amen? Well, let's pray. God, you are good to us. God, we ask that you would help us to know you. Help us to see who you are. Lord, we ask that you would open your word to us as we read it in our, in our own lives. Lord, we ask that you would give us opportunity and boldness to share. Lord, we ask that you would fill us with these crazy stories where people come to us and say, well, can you read with me? Lord, we ask that you would fill your kingdom. Lord, we ask you would frustrate the works of the devil. Lord, we ask that we would see the truth of each of these names that you have given. That you sit in the heavens and laugh. You hold him in derision. Lord, we thank you for being our Savior. Amen. Hi. Hi. Oh, I guess um, if the elders and the prayer team want to come up, and I'll pray for people too, we'd love to pray for you. It's a blessing to be prayed for, and it's a blessing to give prayer. So please come.
Thank you, Lord. God, we just thank you for being here with us right now. We just thank you for the beautiful story, God, that we can look back on throughout all of Scripture, God, and all time. Just see how things have played out, God, and have come to rescue us, God. I just thank you for Jesus and for sending him. Lord, I pray you'd help us to fully understand, at least more fully understand, all the implications of, of Jesus coming to earth, being a human, God as a human, and walking with us, Lord. We, do, we thank you that you meet with us, God, that we can call on you, and sometimes we have to wait, but you meet with us at some point. <laughs> thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us. Just pray you'd walk with us this week and help us to uh, just have an extra dose of intentionality this week as we, um, as we think about uh, Christmas, God, as we think about your son coming down, and as we're doing a million things, Jesus, I just pray you'd help us to... Uh, just enjoy our time with family and our time with you, God. Thank you, Father. Bless this week. Bless everyone here, God, and just go with us. We pray in Jesus' name. We say amen. 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 Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.